Okay, welcome back to BAS 121. We're on chapter 12 on data mining. So uh, we're going to walk through the scope of data mining. We're going to talk about data exploration. We're just exploring for data. Um, classification, where you're trying to uh, predict different categories or outcomes, different techniques that we use. Association, how you, uh, if people buy this, they may buy that. Cause and effect, uh, what are some of the causal factors that determines customer satisfaction or employee satisfaction? So uh, this is a extremely fast growing field. Uh, it's a little bit, um, a lot of folks use different words for different, for the same thing. So there's a lot of vocabulary, but it's very fascinating, interesting field. So let's get to, There we go. Sorry about that. So what is data mining? Data mining is a field of business analytics. So it's part of business analytics. Um, that is based on better understanding the characteristics and patterns. A lot of it's trying to find patterns that we don't know or didn't recognize in large data. Again, it's working in large databases and we're trying to understand characteristics or patterns. Now, the book doesn't talk about this, but in the current literature, there's a lot of talk about unsupervised, Data mining, that's where we have no dependent variable. We're not trying to predict an outcome. It's strictly describing the data, putting it into clusters, et cetera. And then there's what's called supervised data mining. That's where there is a dependent variable. We're trying to predict an outcome. We're trying to predict if we should approve somebody's credit. We're trying to predict what drives customer satisfaction. We're trying to predict uh, do hot dogs get sold with the buns. Uh, let's look at different approaches to data mining. We talked about four. First approach is data exploration and reduction. So we're exploring the data or we're finding ways to compress the data to reduce it. So what we're trying to do is identify groups with similar attributes. So normally it's it's putting the attributes on a grid and and the ones that are close to each other have similar attributes. We cluster together, and we'll show you how to do that. And the ones that are far apart, we put in another group or another cluster. But it's called unsupervised because there's no Y value that we're trying. There's no um, dependent variable that we're trying to solve. So examples might be uh, data compression is a big one. Another one is any kind of web layout to hit right here is Google News, where they talk about which articles are in the world news, which articles are US, which articles are sports, etc. They're just taking all this data, and rather than throwing every article in the world at me, they cluster it so it's more manageable and easier for me. All the world articles are together, all the US articles are together, etc. Second kind is called classification. That's where we're trying to analyze different groups and use them to, to predict. In other words, do these group of people tend to be the folks that throw away junk mail or they keep junk mail? Are they worth sending a flyer to? I'm trying to, lots of times it's understanding my customers. So credit cards use this a lot. Who's gonna respond to a promotion? Who's likely to change to a competitor? Is it my high income people, my low income people? People that are young, old, you're, classifying in different categories to help you make decisions. So again, because we're making decisions, this would be supervised data mining because we're trying to find a determine a Y value or a dependent variable. Uh, association, um, kind of like it says, you're trying to find two uh, data that, that, that are naturally associated, like Netflix and Amazon use, you know, the, the old people who bought this book also read this book. People who watch this movie also watch this movie. If I'm a grocery store, I probably want to put the hot dog buns near the hot dogs, et cetera, et cetera. The last one is cause and effect. That's where I'm trying to take analytics to model. Normally, it's a regression equation, and I'm trying to see does smoking and cancer correlate? You know, banks, regression model to predict, should I approve loads? 
regression model for credit card approvals. Now, you know, a purist would say, well, you haven't proved cause and effect, and, and I agree with that. But in, in business, if I'm an insurance uh, agency and I can use certain things that predict claims and it works, I think I'm going to go with it. So those are the four types that we'll be talking about throughout the chapter. So let's talk, let's get into that data exploration and reduction. So first thing we're going to do to try to reduce the data is what's called cluster analysis. So cluster analysis is where I take all these data points and I lay them out by certain attributes and I and I and I'm they're on a graph and what we do is we try to group them, cluster them together. So here you've got a blue group, a green group, and a red group. And notice they're clustered normally by how close together they are. The assumption is the closer together they are, the more alike they are, the more part of a cluster they are. So just going to take a moment to talk about all we're going to cover in this course is what's called hard clustering. That's where each document or each event belongs to exactly one cluster. It's the most common and it's easiest to do. But there's a whole other field of cluster analysis that we don't get into in this course, but you should be aware of it, what's called soft or fuzzy clustering. That's where a document or a variable could, or an event could belong to many more than one cluster. And I think you can instantly see the potential benefit of that. You know, uh, Nike sneakers probably belong in the sports apparel uh, cluster and in the shoes cluster. Uh, we we talked about the Google articles. Some articles might belong in both the sports section and the world news section. Uh, we won't cover the fuzzy clustering, but I wanted you to be aware of it just so that you know it it's there. So when we're doing clustering, there's two primary methods that uh, most folks use, very common. There's multiple methods, but they're the most common are the hierarchical that's where we uh, connect the different clusters. And the one we're going to go over today is the agglomerative, because that's the most common. We'll tell you what divisive is, but we won't, we'll demonstrate the agglomerative. And then we'll talk about k-means, which is a partitioning method. So the hierarchical met method, the agglomerative is going to say, you know, all of these, all of these are individual clusters in of themselves, and then what we're going to do is based on distance, we'll fuse them together. And we'll keep fusing them until we're down to one big cluster. Then we'll do some analysis to see what's the right number of clusters. K-means is a way of taking the graph and arbitrarily partitioning it into certain areas, and then constructing, we'll show you that too, constructing some iterations where we uh, get the mean of those clusters closer and closer. So here's the agglomerative. So let's say we had uh, points A, B, C, D, E, F, points on the data. Uh, distance is the most natural method for numerical data. Obviously, if it was not numerical data, you know, we can't measure the distance between males and females. Um, the lower the value, the lower the distance, the closer they are to each other. That's going to indicate to us that they're similar. And if you remember old geometry, we're going to bring that back from years ago. Remember uh, right triangle, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And we can always form a right triangle if we want so we can measure distance. That's exactly the math we're going to use. Uh, there are other math approaches to measuring distance, but we're not going to get into those in this course. We're going to do the simple method. Um, so that's what we're going to do. So let me give you an example of this. So let's say we've got these. So we're going to say, well, what's the first group that looks the closest together? Well, A and B look very close together. So we draw a little circle around A and B, and we match them as a cluster. Then the next cluster might be E and F are closest together. And we draw them. And we try to draw this little height. The, far, the farther away, the higher this height will be, which you'll see in a minute. And then the next cluster might be A, B, and C is a cluster. The next cluster might be D and A, B, and C. The next cluster 
might be that. Now we've done. Now we've got one cluster. Well, okay, so we've done this process, and certainly if you went to the boss and said, well, I've clustered all the data and there's one cluster, um, that wouldn't be very helpful. So the next step we do is we say, well, okay, if we're putting some of these clusters together, merging clusters, there's a couple ways we can do it. We could take a single link, cluster the ones the nearest joining neighbors, see that distance. We could take the average distance. There's other methods. We could take the average of the mean and that distance. We could take the furthest points difference. There's a wards method where we square some of the things. All sorts of different ways and different methods to merge the clusters. But once we're done merging and we have our chart or our graph that's called a dendromogram, I probably even. Anyways, now the question becomes where do we want to cut our line? Where do we want to put this line to determine how many clusters we want to have? Because certainly the math is going to take us up to one cluster. Well, that's not very helpful to put, you know, I've clustered the U.S. population into one cluster. That doesn't help very many people. So what you tend to do is you put this line where this distance tends, to, when this distance starts to get large, you start to begin to say, well, I'm clustering those guys, but they're way away from each other. Now, the machine will cluster them. It's going to cluster them all. But you notice up here, I'm clustering them, and they're quite a distance away, whereas down here, they're relatively short distance away. So I'm going to arbitrarily draw this line um, and, and say and put my data into four different clusters. Now, let's do an example of this. You've got the uh, university and colleges, which you can pull up. Uh, let's cluster the university data. Uh, now, we've got five numeric columns. We've got medium SAT score, acceptance rate, expenditure per student, if they were in the top 10% of their high school class, and what was their graduation rate. So we're going to use hierarchical method to get all of these colleges, and I forget how many of them are, 50 or so, uh, into different categories. So we're going to call up our add in our Excel miner, which is our uh, frontline tool to do uh, data mining. And we're going to do data reduction and exploration. And we're going to do hierarchical clustering. And a screen like this will pull up. We're going to set our data range, put our data range right in there. We're going to select the variables that we want to. Uh, do our clustering on. So those are our five numerical uh, uh, variables. And in the real world, you would try different ones, right? This is a very iterative process. You would try different variables to see if you got better clusters. But here in this example, we're going to try all five and see what clusters we come up with. Uh, then uh, we'll, normal, what we, we'll normalize our input. Uh, Euclidean distance, that means we're using what I showed you, the simple uh, uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In our clustering linkage method, remember we showed you lots of linkage methods. There's a single linkage, the closest ones, the average, there's a ward. We're going to use the average group linkage. You can try different ones. Step three, we're going to ask it to draw, it's going to ask us to draw the dendrogram. And it'll show the cluster membership. Now, we have to tell it how many clusters. This will stop it so it doesn't go all the way up to one cluster. So we're going to try. And, and four clusters is usually a good place to start in your analysis. Like I say, normally this will be iterative. Or you could take it all the way up to one, take a look at it, and then come back and do the analysis and, and do four after you've looked at where there's some natural splits. But in this case, we're going to put in four clusters, and we're going to get an output, which is going to give us uh, some input information, some data set information on all of our inputs, and it's going to give us our denogram. Notice it goes all the way here. Uh, it's going to give us our x and y axis, and it's going to show us some different clustering of colleges. Uh, here's the clustering prediction for each row, which cluster they're put into. And finally, it's going to cluster them by the four clusters we asked for. Cluster 1's got 23 colleges. 
cluster 2, 22, and so forth. And then if we took a look at the clusters 3 and 4, we can see Cal Berkeley, UCLA, and UNC Chapel Hill, very similar in nature, very similar cluster in terms of SATs, acceptance, expenditures, percent they're in the top 10, percent graduating rate. And then the fourth cluster is a very dissimilar one, Caltech, very much higher SAT scores and very much higher student expenditures per students. Now, we don't show you clusters one and two because there's 22 and 23 of them in there, but you'd have a similar result for those. There's sim we've, so we've taken 50 colleges and we've bucketed them into four distinctive clusters where each one is uh, similar to the other mates in its clusters. And sometimes you, you only get one college in a cluster. There, Caltech, there aren't a lot of schools that, that have a medium SAT score of 1,400 in expenditure per student, thank heaven for those of you with student college kids, of $102,000. So that's uh, a reminder. There's hierarchical method, agglomeration. Then there's div divisive is just a little different. Now, the agglomerative, remember, we assumed every single data point was a cluster. And we fused them together until we got one cluster. And then we said, drew a line to say, we want four clusters. And that's what we produced in the example with the college students. Division, which I won't show you as much, is where you just kind of do the exact opposite. You make the assumption that you start with one cluster, and then you break it into two. And then you break it into three, based on distance. K-means is a partitioning method. What you do with K-means is you say, let me take my graph and let me partition it into three categories and I'll pick three arbitrary center points for my clusters and based on how far the way they are from my arbitrary uh, cluster and I could pick three if I want three clusters that's why it's called K means I pick K is the number of clusters I pick so if I want five clusters I would play, pick five arbitrary points is one method they don't have to be arbitrary. There's other, like I say, there's multiple ways to do this. But the most common way is you pick five or however many clusters you want, arbitrary means, and then there'll be an iterative process to get the clusters closer and closer to that mean. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. But those are the two main ones. So let's look at k-means. It's a little different than the hierarchical. Remember the hierarchical, we said every point was a cluster in and of itself, and then we fused together whichever points were closest to each other based on distance. And we kept doing that until we only had one cluster. Then we went back and did some analysis and said, how many clusters do we want? In k-means, you guess the number of clusters you want up front, whether it's two, three, or four. So what a lot of people do is they do the agglomerative method to see how what k should be, and then they come back and do the k-means to refine the analysis. But in this example, we know k is equal to 2. So we pick two arbitrary seeds or arbitrary means. You can see them in red and in blue. So we're going to say we're going to partition the da data based on those two means. Now you say, well, that those don't look like very good clusters, but you'll see the iterative process that'll improve. So we'll assign <coughs> each one of our points to whichever mean or k it's closest to. So there you see we've got a cluster of red and a cluster of blue on our first pass, which doesn't look particularly good. But now what we'll do is we'll take the average of all our reds and the average of all the, the blues and compute what's called a new centroid or a new mean or a new center, okay? And then we'll iterate this process again and recluster everything based on those new means. So they'll get reassigned to a new cluster. And then we'll do this over again until we get convergence. So we'll reassign them. And then we have converged around the centroid here and the centroid here. And we've clustered our data using k-means. Uh, let's talk about classification. So classification is a reminder. Now we're going to take all these clusters and we're going to analyze these groups or of data so that we can use it to predict something. So now we're doing supervised data mining. 
We're looking at clusters or classifications so that we can predict, is this guy going to respond to a mailing? Should I approve this guy's credit, et cetera? So in this example, oh, here it is, a credit card approval decision. So we're going to use categorical data This is a variable of interest. So in this, in, in classification, now we're, we're predicting a Y or a dependent variable, but the depend, dependent variable we're picking is a categorical data, right? We're trying to say, is the decision approve or is the decision a reject? So here we have the predictor variables in columns A through E. Uh, do they own a home? What's their credit score? What's their years of credit history? What's their revolving balance? What's their revolving utilization? And based on these five criterias or these five classifications where they are, we will approve or reject uh, the credit. So first thing we need to do is we have to turn some of the categorical data into numeric. Because remember, our Y variable is going to be uh, categorical, a decision yes or no, but some of our X variables might be categorical. So we're going to turn all of them to no matter numerical data by, by assigning the dummy variable of a 0 for 1 and a 0 for no and a 1 for yes, a 0 for reject and a 1 for approve. And notice we've gone into the data set and we've done that. Now, we're going to take the large bubbles and correspond to the rejected act. Now we've got to come up with some approval decisions. So we've got a classification rule. Reject if credit score is under 640. So here we've got credit scores uh, uh, and whether we approve or don't approve. Now, there's what's called misclassification. That's where they actually were approved, but our model wouldn't have approved them. So we got it wrong. And here you can do the math. Our misclassification were only 2 out of 50, which is extremely good. Uh, so that's only a 4% misclassification. Uh, oftentimes you can have misclassifications uh, higher than 4%. Here's another way to look at it, a, a different rule, classification rule. Reject if uh, uh, 0.095 credit scar plus years of credit history is less than 74.65. Again, we can draw this and see what kind of misclassifications we get. Here this is explaining the misclassifications where we have where the actual decision versus the predicted decision. Perfect world, we, what we predicted and what actually happened would always be correct, but you always have a de degree of misclassification and that's what helps you determine which model is the best and continue to improve the model. So Normally, when you do classification and data mining in large data sets, so we haven't talked about this yet, oftentimes, because you have lots and lots and lots of data, you will take the data and you will partition it into what's called a training data set, also known as outcome and is used to teach the data mining algorithm, right? So we're training or we're, we're working on that data set to develop our model. Then there's what's called a validation data set. That's where we test that training data set um, to validate it on a different set of data. And then there's the test data set where we test the accuracy of the model. So most of your more sophisticated data analysis packages will do the partition for you because we randomly partition the data. Excel Miner will do it. The only thing that sometimes happens is what percentage do you want in a training data set? Normally the highest percentage goes there, then a certain percentage in the data validation, and then a certain percentage in the test. So you can do this. Excel Miner will partition, partition it for it. You just go partitioning data, and you say standard partitioning. You pick the range, and you say pick the rows randomly. Uh, variable partitioned, I want all of them partitioned. And then percent, partitioning percentage is automatic. Now it defaults to 60% in the training set and 40% in the validation set. Because oftentimes you don't actually do a test set. You validate it and, and then you deploy it. Um, 
So the partitioning, you've got options. As I said, the automatic is 60% training, 40% validation. You could specify. You could say, give it to me equal record. That would probably be rare. Uh, it could go a third, a third, a third. But the point is, the computer will do it all for you. Uh, so here's what we get when we uh, seg segment it out. There you can see the first 30 rows of the training, the bottom of our validation sets. Now, we can use the classification rule in example 12.2 of, you know, scores when I add this up of under 74.6. It allows us to take a look at all these scores, all of these, uh, the, the data set all classified. And that allows us to validate our models and deploy it. Now, let's talk about different classification techniques. There's three uh, One's K nearest neighbor finds records in the neighborhood that have similar numeric values of a set of predictor values. Discriminant analysis is where we've got X as a categorical, or excuse me, Y as a categorical, X is normally numeric. Now we'll turn them, you know, we may, may turn them in with dummy variables, but we used a predefined class base on a set of linear discriminant functions of predictor variables. Logistic regression is another tool used. That's to estimate the probability of belonging to a categorical, to, to a certain category, using a regression on the predictor variables. Um, nearest neighbor, we th we've seen a lot of this. It's measuring the Euclidean distance between the records. If k equals 1, then the n rule classifies a record in the same category as its nearest neighbor. Um, if k is too uh, small, then we have very, very high variability. Remember, we talked about this earlier. If I, if, I, if I cluster everything into one cluster, it doesn't tell me one. If k is too large, then I have a lot of bias introduced, right? I've, I've, re, uh, I've brought in way too much specificity. Uh, typically, you, various, you vary your k to determine which the best results are. And like I said, this is a very iterative process. So if we classify credit decisions usually using the K, we simply go into XL minor, go into classification, go into K, K nearest neighbor, put in our input, and it outputs a decision for us. We normalize our input. We tell it what our K is. We want five Ks. Uh, score on the best K between one and some specific value. And there it goes. Tells us the best model is when K is equal to two. So it went ahead and determined all that based on an error validation. It already tells us that we should build a model with K equal to two. And it tells us the percent misclassifications. Um, if we had new data, uh, we could we could enter our new data in. We could put uh, we just give it the range. Uh, we match the variables with the same names, and then half the applications are approved. And then we we could work the same way to get our K and refine our model. Discriminant analysis. This is where we determine a class using linear discriminant functions. So the B1s are the discriminant coefficients or the weights. So we're weighting each one of these variables. Notice it's a linear variable, right? Uh, one discriminant function is formed for each category. So each category is basically, we're weighting them, right? So same thing, we're gonna go in, we're gonna go to into XL minor, classification, discriminant, discriminant analysis. We'll input our, our variables right over here. We'll have an output decision. We want us to, the output is what the decision. Uh, prior class probabilities, normally we'll use the prior probabilities. Misclassification costs, success one, failure one, we're weighting them the same. Give us an output of a summary report and a score validation report. Now you can ask for the other reports too, like a lift report, et cetera, but these are the normal ones that we'll ask for here. And it gives us all of this information, and it tells us what our equation is, how much we should weight each one of these, right? So our credit decision is there's our um, y-axis, there's how much we weight whether they're a homeowner, there's the weighting we give to the credit score, there's the weighting we give to the years, and then 
There it gives us all the classifications. Now, this gives us, there's no misclassifications in the data set, which is good. There's 15, which, which, is, which is normal, right? Because we use the training set to develop the model. We use the validation to validate what we found in the training model, in the training data. And we found 15% misclassifications, which is not, a, that's not bad. All right, now we can use discriminant analysis for classifying new data. It works very much the same way, except you have to pull in and pull down and give it your data range of your new data, the data range, the variables you want to determine it on, and then you have um, half the applicants are in the approved based on our models, and that's how you do discriminant analysis for new data. The last thing is called logistic regression, the last tool. This is a variation of linear regression, except now the dependent variable is categorical. So in linear regression, you remember, we're predicting a numerical value. Here we're uh, logistic regression, we're predicting success or failure, buy, don't buy. So the model will predict, and it's based very much on the odds of belonging to this category or that category. If you remember when we went through probability, we saw a lot of p hats and one minus p hat. That's what we're doing. So the logic function is defined as the uh, ln, that's the uh, log root of e. Uh, for those, in, don't worry about it. If It's just in there, it gives us a function. Uh, here we can classify credit approvals, same thing, we just do logistic regression, we do the data partitioning, the number of inputs, we want a decision. Uh, step two, we set a confidence interval for odds, and we come up with the best subset. And it gives us a selection of what we need on the summary report. And in a different video, I'll go through what all of these things um, uh, how to read all of this stuff. There's our regression model, and there's a number of misclassifications in the validation set, and then we can partition the data. New data works very similar. Association, this is where we're trying to come up with rules, affinities, seek to often cover association in large data sets. This is often called market basket analysis. So here's a customer computer configuration. Suppose we want to know which computer components are often ordered together, which ones group together. Okay, we're going to measure the support. In other words, what's the probability that they do? What's the probability that they don't? We're also going to measure the, the lift, which is the ratio of confidence to expected confidence. So here's the example 12.13. A supermarket database has 100,000 points of sales. 2,000 include both A and B. You can read it. We go through the association. We calculate our support. We calculate our confidence. We calculate our expected confidence and we calculate our lift. Now, we can go ahead and go identify these rules. We go to Excel Miner again, Association, Affinity. We do our worksheet as our market basket, our data, data range we put in. Uh, we say we've got first row headers because that A5 is a header. Minimal support is five, minimum confidence is 80. You set your minimums for what you'll accept. So this will this will give you your output. This will identify the association rules. Now the rules are sorted sorted by their lift ratio. The lift ratio is how much more likely is one to purchase the consequence if they purchased the antecedent. In other words, how much lift me buying a car? How much lift? How much more likely am I now than normal to buy? Uh, car mats, for example. So what this is saying is if they bought this, they're very likely to buy this. If they bought this, they're very likely to buy this, by this lift ratio. Last area is cause and effect. 
So cause and effect is a correlation. Sometimes we have lagging measures, sometimes we have leading leading measures. Lagging, lagging measures, measures tend to be how much profit did we make, market share, customer satisfaction. Leading measures might be employee sat, productivity, and turnover. So the example here is to take some uh, satisfaction measures and try to use them to predict, um, I think we want to predict uh, employee satisfaction here. So here we can see we've correlated them with XL minor. And you can see some are very highly correlated, like employee satisfaction is very highly correlated with job satisfaction. Uh, employee satisfaction is very highly correlated with if they like their supervisor or not. Um, so we could predict customer satisfaction based on if they like their supervisor, they're very likely to be satisfied. If they have employee satisfaction, it's a good predictor of customer satisfaction. So if you're well-trained and you like your supervisor, you're going to have most likely an empl uh, employee with high satisfaction. And that's going to influence, and you can see the number, the weight of the influence is there. Not that they have a total influence on customer satisfaction, but good employees tend to produce good products, provide good customer service, and that's what this data is telling us. So that's it for Chapter 12. We went through it relatively quickly. If you have questions, let me know, and we can go through it in more detail. Uh, have a great day.